March 2, 2008, Jamil Shaw was on his way home when an 18th Street gang member stopped him and brutally gunned him down execution style. Why? Simply for wearing a Spider-Man bag. These are five teen killers who joined the 18th Street as kids. 18th Street Gang Sabemos que somos gangsters porque no hay nada fuera de la 18. In Southern California alone, the gang known as 18th Street or Barrio 18 is boasting a staggering membership of up to 20,000 individuals. To put that into perspective, the gang is 20 times larger than your average regional gang, making even the notorious Bloods and Crips seem small in comparison. According to American authorities, 18th Street is not only recognized as one of the most violent gangs, but also one of the most prolific in the entire nation. Wherever 18th Street surfaces, the quality of life inevitably suffers. Cars are stolen, homes burglarized. On average, someone in LA County is assaulted or robbed by 18th Streeters every single day. And while their primary source of income stems from the street-level distribution of drugs, the gang's criminal activities extend far beyond that. They've been linked to a wide range of heinous acts, including murders, arson, extortion, kidnapping, robbery, and that's just to name a few. In the words of gang expert Gabriel Kovnader, They're worse than a cancer, a cancer you can kill. These guys keep growing. 18th Street Gang kill thousands per year. They use extortion to control entire neighborhoods, leading people to flee for their lives. On 18th Street, there's no godfather. Instead, the gang operates through a network of older members known as veteranos. These veterans oversee various cliques within the gang, and the members of these cliques share a strong loyalty to the gang's values and goals. During clandestine meetings, the veteranos exchange weapons, strategize their moves, identify their enemies, and share information about the police. But when you hit the streets, you'll see a different side of the gang. The 18th Street Gang has found another member. His name is Little Mousy. He's only nine years old. One of the most distinctive features of 18th Street is that it resembles a children's army. So while the veterans stay hidden in the shadows, young recruits are brought in to boost the gang's numbers and carry out their criminal activities. A recruiter for the gang in Santa Ana has a specific strategy. He scouts middle schools, looking for kids between 11 and 13 who seem to be on the fringes of gang life. He approaches them, instilling fear at first, but then he backs off. The next time, he takes a softer approach, making these vulnerable targets believe that he's now their friend, their protector. Once their resistance is weakened, he promises them action and excitement as part of the largest street gang in the region. You can get guns and drugs, you get women, you get backup, he tells them. He knows that the key is to make it all look glamorous, avoiding any mention of jail time or violence. If you scare them off, you've lost them. You have to lure them in, he explains. <laughs> Those unfortunate kids sure might feel invincible for a while, going around taking lives and taking whatever they please with their power trip. But sooner or later, reality hits them hard. Whether it's a lifetime locked up or a deadly encounter with the Grim Reaper, that's when they finally realize maybe it wasn't worth it. And now let's dive into some real life stories of five teen killers who joined the notorious 18th Street when they were just kids and see how their lives unfolded. Number five, Pedro Espinoza. Pedro Espinoza, an 18th Street member with slick black hair and tats on his neck and arms, once bragged to a parole supervisor that he aspired to land on death row for his allegiance. November 9th, 2012, Espinoza's wish came true. The 23-year-old was sentenced to prison for the murder of Jamil Shaw II, a talented football prospect from LA High School who was tragically killed while walking home from a friend's house. Now what led Espinoza to commit such a heinous act? Let's go back to the beginning. Espinoza was brought to the US from Mexico as an infant by his mom. Growing up in a neighborhood plagued by gangs, Espinoza would join 18th Street at a young age. He had an extensive criminal record, and the day before Shaw's murder, Espinoza had been released from the LAPD on previous gun charges. 
receiving an early release from jail. But what about Jamil? Well, Jamil Shaw II was a junior at LA High School and a talented student athlete. His exceptional skills had attracted the attention of prestigious colleges, promising a bright future. However, tragedy struck when he crossed paths with Pedro Espinosa. March 2, 2008, Jamil was on his way home after his usual training session. Out of nowhere, two Hispanic men jumped out of a car and confronted him, demanding to know which gang he belonged to. Caught off guard, Jamil hesitated to answer, and before he could say anything, Espinosa shot him in the stomach. Jamil collapsed to the ground, desperately trying to shield his head with his hands. But Espinosa wasn't satisfied with just one shot. He shot him again, this time in the head, execution style. Jamil's father heard that gunshot, ran outside, and held his son in his arms as he took his last breath. Within an hour of Jamil's senseless murder, the police managed to track and apprehend Espinosa. During this investigation, Espinosa coldly confessed that he believed Jamil's red Spider-Man backpack was a symbol of his affiliation with the rival gang, the Rolling Twenties. Without a shred of remorse, he admitted that he was willing to kill for his gang, even if it meant facing the ultimate consequences. May 9, 2012, Espinosa was given first-degree murder. The guilty verdict also included special circumstances, making him eligible for capital punishment. And so, the jury sentenced Espinosa to death. They Number 4. Rigoberto Machado Rigoberto Machado was only 16 years old when he faced charges for the murder of Sera Gutierrez Villatoro. November 29, 2019 It all started when Montgomery County Police received a call about something suspicious happening in a remote wooded area in Maryland. A hiker had stumbled upon the lifeless body of 19-year-old Sara Gutierrez Villatoro. The investigation revealed that she had been shot multiple times and her death was ruled a homicide. As the investigation progressed, it became clear that the eight members of the notorious 18th Street had been seen near Sarah's home on the same day she was murdered. They'd also been spotted in the same location three weeks prior, searching for the woman they intended to kill. But what had Sarah done to earn the gang's wrath? Well, it turns out Sarah had been in a relationship with a member of 18th Street who suspected her of cheating. To add fuel to the fire, he thought she was involved with someone from their number one rival gang, MS-13. And so, Sarah's fate would be sealed for nothing more than a whim. The police managed to apprehend four individuals in connection with this brutal murder. Jordan Ryan Moreno, 21. Jonathan Rivera Escobar, 19. Giovanni Dominguez Escobar, 24. And Rigoberto Machado, 18. The details of the crime unfolded as investigators pieced together the chilling events. It all started when Sarah's boyfriend, who was also one of the conspirators, reached out to her and arranged a meeting on that November evening. The gang members gathered together and picked up Sarah in Washington, D.C., before making their way to a desolate location in Maryland. As they arrived at a wooded area, they passed around a gun and then shot Sarah at close range. Sarah was mercilessly shot several times and her lifeless body was abandoned in the woods. The following day, the DC police captured Dominguez Escobar, Moreno, and Machado, seen on body POV during a routine traffic stop. October 22, 2020, Machado faced trial as an adult. He ultimately pled guilty and received a 50-year sentence instead of life in prison. Number 3. Junior Zelaya Canales With an iron fist, Junior executed anyone who dared cross his gang. Want to join his inner circle? Prove your devotion with a kill. Now, Despite his young age of 21, Zelaya Canales held a prominent position as a regional leader within 18th Street. He became involved with the gang during his childhood and quickly rose through the ranks, committing heinous crimes in the name of the gang along the way. September 12, 2016, at around 1 a.m., the Hempstead Police Department received a report of gunshots near the intersection of Linden Avenue and Laurel Avenue in Hempstead. 
Upon arrival, officers had found the lifeless body of Josue Guzman lying near the curb, having been shot in the back of the head. Guzman was pronounced dead at the scene. A junior had instructed two lower-level gang members to carry out the murder of Josue as a means of proving their loyalty to the 18th Street. This act of violence was ordered because Guzman allegedly offended members of the gang. July 9, 2017, Junior orchestrated a shooting targeting rival gang members in Woodhaven, Queens, as a result of a territorial dispute. At approximately 10.30 p.m., the NYPD responded to a 911 call reporting gunshots in the vicinity of 86th Road in Woodhaven. Upon investigation, officers recovered 9mm shell casings at the scene. A month later, NYPD detectives, while investigating the shooting, obtained a search warrant for Zelaya Canales' apartment. During that search, they found a 9mm Ruger handgun with a defaced serial number, along with numerous rounds of ammo. Subsequent ballistic tests confirmed that the Ruger handgun was the weapon used to fire the 9mm shell casings found at the Woodhaven shooting scene. So on December 11, 2019, Junior Zelaya Canales was found guilty of murder in connection with racketeering and conspiracy to commit murder. Number 2. Rogelio Andrade and Alan Lobos November 26, 1998 More than five years after a devastating arson fire claimed the lives of three women and seven more in a tenement building west of downtown LA. Prosecutors finally filed multiple murder charges against two members of the notorious 18th Street. Andrade and Lobos, both 22 years old at the time, were accused of igniting this fire as a means to intimidate an apartment manager who had been trying to rid her property of drug dealers. From the very beginning, investigators had suspected that the gang members were responsible for the deadly fire. However, it wasn't until another gang member who had been arrested for an unrelated murder came forward and revealed that he knew who started that Burlington fire, that the perpetrators were identified. The police wasted no time apprehending Andrade, while Lobos was already serving time in state prison for another murder. Both men had been deeply involved with 18th Street since they were kids and had a long history of run-ins with law enforcement. Their most serious offense occurred in 97 when Lobos fatally shot Alexandro Garcia, who was simply waiting for a bus to school. Lobos was convicted of second-degree murder and received a sentence of 15 years to life for that heinous act. But what about that deadly fire? May 3, 1993, the 69-unit apartment building located at 330 S Burlington Avenue was just one of many in the impoverished Westlake community plagued by gang activity. Just hours before the fire erupted, the apartment manager had ordered two men to leave the building suspecting them of drug dealing. On that scorching late afternoon, the flames raced through the building. Tenants tried to escape by scrambling down fire escapes and climbing down bedsheets tied to balconies. People would form human chains, hoisting residents down from the upper floors. But on the second and third floors, five doors were either propped or nailed shut. And that's where most of the victims met a suffocating end. In the investigation that followed this tragic incident, LAPD officials confirmed that the apartment building was a hub for 18th Street lucrative drug trades. These dealers were raking in thousands of dollars daily, with a significant portion of that earning coming from the Burlington building. Both Lobos and Andrade were initially charged as adults, but as the investigation progressed and prosecutors built their case, an unexpected turn of events occurred. January 7, 2000. All murder charges against the two 18th Street members were dropped. The prosecutor claimed that there was insufficient evidence to prove that the two were responsible for starting that fire. The information provided by witnesses which led to their arrests didn't hold up after the subsequent investigation. As a result, Andrade was released while Lobos remained in state prison serving his original sentence. However, our story doesn't end there. 2017, after decades of investigation, the police made a surprising breakthrough. They announced the arrest of three suspects, two men and a woman, finally bringing closure to one of the most devastating arson fires in LA's history. And guess what? All three were members of the 18th Street. They all pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and admitted their affiliation with the gang. But this development raises questions about Andrade and Lobos. What if they were truly involved all along? After all, where there's smoke, there's usually fire.
And number 1. Catarino Gonzalez Jr. June 21st, 2001. Caterino was only 23 years old when he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This news brought relief to Gonzalez's family, as the jury didn't recommend the death penalty. Oscar, Caterino's older brother, said his brother's life spiraled out of control when he left Crenshaw to join the Marines. In the neighborhood we lived in, if you didn't have an older brother as a strong male role model, it's almost a given that you would fall into a gang. And fall into a gang he did. As a teenager, Caterino joined the notorious 18th Street, and from then on, he found himself constantly in trouble with the law. But what exactly did he do that landed him in prison for good? August 9, 1998, LAPD officer Philbert Cuesta and his partner, Richard Gabaldon, were on patrol when they noticed a group of gang members entering a wedding reception, and they saw him showing their guns and threatening the party hostess and the guests. Outnumbered and sensing danger, the officers decided to wait for backup in their car. Little did they know that a storm of bullets would rain down on them. The rear windshield was shot out and the car began to roll forward, then turned sharply left and hit a parked car. Officer Gabaldon looked over at his partner, Cuesta, who was slumped forward, his head resting on his chest, and he was bleeding uncontrollably from a gunshot wound to the head. Gabaldon got out of the car with his weapon drawn and locked in the direction from which the shots had been fired. He saw three or four men running from the corner and fired at him, but they quickly ran from the scene. Two eyewitnesses saw the shooting and both identified Gonzalez as the main shooter. During his trial, Gonzalez claimed that he believed the officers were there to arrest him for violating his probation. However, the circumstances surrounding the crime strongly suggested otherwise. Gonzalez was actually on felony probation for a drug-related conviction when the shooting occurred. And guess who happened to be the arresting officer on the case? None other than Philbert Cuesta. When Gonzalez caught sight of Cuesta sitting in the patrol car, he made the despicable choice to commit his crime in the most cowardly manner imaginable. Sneaking around the entire block, he attacked Cuesta from behind and ended his life. To add insult to injury just five days prior to the shooting, Gonzalez was arrested again for suspected public drinking. And if that wasn't enough the following day, Officers discovered spray paint that seemed to indicate Gonzalez was planning to seek revenge against the police. As you'd expect when Gonzalez stood before the judge in court, there were no gentle punches. His sentence? A lifetime behind bars, no chance of parole, and no way out. Now, try to put yourself in the shoes of those kids. After being told repeatedly that they were invincible by their leaders, they suddenly have to deal with the consequences of their actions. At that very moment, do you think they'd still believe their unwavering loyalty to the gang is a price worth paying their lives? The sad thing is that most of them fail to realize it in time.